Well, thank you, everybody, uh, and, and thanks for, for being here, especially after session. I know that everybody uh, session can be draining and, and recharging to both. So uh, I appreciate you being here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit, if you'll indulge me. Um, and I have turned the recording on. That's good. She told me I did. And uh, I made some notes. Uh, and I, I called this Echoes and Shadows, or my personal Sangha. And I always open by saying these are just my personal perspectives, so please don't believe a word I say. Do your own investigation. But we'll have a chance perhaps to talk about that um, after we sit again. So um, I hope some of this lands and has, has some impact for you. Um, my friend uh, Barbara Salam Wegmuller uh, in Switzerland is um, both a, a, a Roshi in the White Plum lineage as well as the Zen Peacemaker lineage. Uh, and she's a Sufi, hence the Salam part of her name. Uh, and just as an aside, if you ever have a chance to attend a council that she leads. Uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful facilitator of council. Uh, she does a women's uh, a women's only council for us about once a month. And I was talking to her recently, and she and she shared the notion of my personal sangha. And what she explained that she meant by this is um, those various self images that she's become aware of that she carries about through her life and that emerge and have a speaking part from time to time. This really impressed me. Uh, I instantly related to it and uh, because I'm, a num I'm aware of uh, a number of Jeffs who have at times been in charge of the Jeff show. That have sort of taken over when I wasn't paying attention. 50 years ago, I was returning to LA from a dead concert in uh, Santa Barbara with a car full of hippies. I'm, Highway 101 headed south into LA and I was driving and I fell asleep at the wheel and woke, woke me up. I don't know why I thought of that, but it's, it feels a little bit like that sometimes. Barbara told me that she's gone so far as to name these images, these ghosts, and to welcome them to a meal and a chat. So I pictured her with all of her sangha around the table in Switzerland, eating cheese and chocolate and laughing and sharing stories. And then I saw me and my guys hanging out, swapping tall tales and uh, self-aggrandizing whoppers, things that should never be spoken of. But me nonetheless wary to make sure that they don't grab the wheel of my life car again. But they do sometimes. Uh, when I first thought of and, and made a few notes for this talk, uh, it was because of because of this that I'll, I'll share with you. Um, I've been scheduled for a relatively routine medical procedure recently. It's no, no emergency, but it's still one that you need to have done. And uh, I spoke with Sandy after I'd scheduled it and shared the time that I chose. And, uh, and she offered that that wasn't good for her because she wasn't able to get away from work. And it was required that, you know, someone drive me back and forth. And might I schedule this for a better time? And it was really interesting. What I saw happen inside of me was this old pattern. Having something important to me feel like 
it's denied. And of course, in this instance, certainly it was not being denied. But nonetheless, it triggered me and a little boy emerged from the shadows. Now I have to admit, I had a happy childhood. Um, no trauma, no crisis. I was never abused, nor did I go without stuff. We didn't have hardly anything. We had very little. Our means were modest of a working family's life, but you know, we, we had what we needed. But my folks were, you know, depression era survivors, World War II era people. And they were kind of short on physical and verbal affection or affirmation. I wasn't really part of me being a kid. Uh, the I love you part or, you know, the you're great part or uh, you can do it, that part. So I imagine maybe, I don't really know um, what the mechanics were, but I, I imagine that I internalized that longing and loss for love and support and affirmation. So since I was a kid, I've, I've always really easily denied myself choosing rather to be independent and go my own way rather than uh, to need love. You know, there's this voice, you can't withhold that from me because I don't really want it. I'll just go off by myself in the rain with my hat down and my collar up. This is really familiar ground. That reaction has come up more times um, than I can count in my later adult life. And at times I, I've denied myself doing things that I really did need to do to take care of myself. Oftentimes for months or even years. But the reaction never fit the current reality. It was shadowy. It was an echo. It was a ghost of a kid, a hungry one. So I responded to Sandy calmly and kept this little kid to myself. And I said, no problem. I'll call and reschedule for a better time. I didn't mean that, of course. Inside the voice I heard was, fuck it, I'll cancel. I'm never going to the doctor again. I don't need doctors. Somehow that, that's like scratching an itch. I was kind of stunned to see him again. But I was also so pleased to be able to watch and laugh a little bit, knowing that I was only seeing a ghost. An old friend that I knew so well. I'm not sure everyone's going to relate to this, but I, I, the picture in my head is of Angus Young from ACDC with a little suit jacket on and little shorts and <laughs> a little tie. And, a little schoolboy cap, a surly little kid. Anyway, that was Sunday afternoon several weeks ago. Monday morning, I called and rescheduled the appointment like an actual adult would do. So it was momentary. In the past, it hasn't always been momentary. I took some joy and some solace in that. I've got a closet full of coats and hats and scarves and other articles of clothing, clothing that uh, far exceed my need to stay warm or to be modest or to be appropriate. And I know that many of those things are part of various costumes. They support my self images, which appeal to some of those echoes and shadows. 
And some of these images are harmless and perhaps even helpful. And others can be a real problem. Being aware of them is my practice. Staying awake when they are summoned by circumstances is the call to action. Or rather, maybe you know, more appropriately, the call to silence and stillness. I just I thought about this and I just I wrote down a few. I, you know, I I I was able to identify a dozen distinct shadow people inside of me. A hurt child who doesn't need anything. You can't hurt me, I'll just leave. Maybe that kid's name is Angus, who knows. There's a justice warrior in there who sees clear black and white and is very righteous and very proud of always being on the right side and always knowing and, and being, being correct. Maybe his name is Abby. There's a Zen student named Sean. And there's a good boy uh, who's always aware of who's the authority and who's always watching for approval from that authority. The overachiever who's had dozens of jobs in his life and never been fired from one. The type A guy who uh, worked hard and became president of five companies. Always on time. No, always early. I don't know, maybe his name is Jeffrey. I don't know if that's me or not. And there's a bad boy who rebels against Jeffrey. That guy's name is Spike. There's an attention sponge. There's a scholar, a lazy scholar at that. There's an addict for sure. There's an artist, there's an empath. There's a lover, there's a 60s survivor. Very proud of that survival, who has a whole costume in the closet. My path with these old friends these days is not to indulge or encourage them, but also not to try to suppress or eradicate them either, but instead to welcome them, to be, become intimate with their unique characteristics and how they work me. <laughs> and how I can hold them lovingly with open hands. After 68 years, I'm pretty convinced they're here to stay. I have no chance or really, I don't have any need to wipe them out. They are my life. They are my karma. And I'm comfortable getting comfortable with them. Over the year, over the years, I've had, uh, you know, human friends, not ghosts, real people who were hell's angels, criminals, toxic narcissists, radicals, drug dealers, authoritarians, fundamentalists and every kind of other person. And I've always enjoyed finding common ground with just about anyone. So I'm comfortable welcoming these ghosts and these echoes and these shadows. I may go so far as to draw or paint each of these dozen 
name the rest of them and po post them on the wall of my office. Years ago, I, I did a drawing of, uh, of, of, of two that were opposites and somehow I misplaced that. These are my personal sangha, as Barbara called them. They're my family. I see them distinctly when they come up. I recognize them. And I see them as part of my whole person. Diverse and unified. I and we. All one together. What a clown show. <laughs> My experience is these shadowy guys, these shadow guys never do go away, like I said. Over time with practicing stillness, at best, uh, I get to enjoy a little more time before they emerge and a little more space between me and them when they do. In this little bit of time and space, happily now, I get to decide what I choose. The next thing that I do. Unless somehow I've fallen asleep at the wheel again. Uh, this morning I was talking to my friend uh, Roshi Genjo Marinello. Uh, he's a, a Rinzai teacher at a temple in Seattle. And he said something that was extraordinary. I was talking to him about this. And he said, our own inner children only become demons when they are not invited to the table. When we are good parents and welcome them, they cease being demons and they show up as children, simply needing our love. What are your shadows and echoes and self-images that are out of sync with the current conditions of your life? Shouting stage direction from the wings. Who are your wayward children crying out for your love? Who are your Angus, Abby, and Spike? <laughs> 